So let's go ahead and begin. Uh, Stephen's book, uh, Tomorrow the World, was uh, published uh, just about two weeks ago. Uh, I have read it, and I can assure you that it is a uh, genuinely original, fascinating, and brilliant uh, contribution to American historiography. Uh, and it's a pleasure for me to host this, this, this discussion with the author. In better days or different days, these are pretty good days. In different days, we would be uh, hosting an event of 500 people in some uh, hotel ballroom and we'd be lifting a glass in Stephen's uh, honor. But you know, we are where we are and we're gonna make, uh, make the best of things. Again, I'm Andrew Basevich. I'm the president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, the transpartisan think tank uh, in Washington uh, that tries to, will move uh, U.S. foreign policy away from endless war uh, toward prudence and realism. We stand for a national security strategy centered on restraint and creative diplomacy. Now, for most of its history, the United States had avoided uh, making uh, military commitments that would entangle us uh, in European style power politics. With the onset of World War II, however, uh, that changed. And it changed in ways in which we have never looked back. In just the 18 months prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor, that's significant, prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, US officials uh, and policy intellectuals decided not only to enter the war, but to commit the United States to a foreign policy of perpetual domination. We still live with that decision today, uh, even though it's actually long since out, outlived any, any serious rationale. In the 21st century, our, our century, attempting to dominate the world by force has left the United States in a condition of endless war and it has cost us dearly. So please join me now in welcoming Stephen to speak. We'll have a conversation about his book that'll probably go on for about 25 minutes or, though, or so. And at that point, uh, we'd like to entertain your questions uh, and discussion. I'm not a techie, but my script says, but for those of you who are joining us via Zoom, you can use the, the Q&A function to ask questions. And for those watching via YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, please write your questions in the comments section. So welcome, Stephen. Let's have our conversation. And let's begin with, a, with an easy question uh, about why you wrote the book. Uh, what, what in particular drew you to this subject? Well, that might be the hardest question of all. But first of all, I want to thank everybody for uh, taking the time this afternoon. Uh, to be with us, and I am uh, simply honored to be able to launch my book in conversation with you, Andrew Basevich. Uh, you know, I uh, approached the book because of what was around me as I matured. I saw the United States making many mistakes in its foreign policy. I also thought that the debate surrounding American foreign policy was incredibly narrow. It seemed to be very difficult to suggest, well, maybe a war shouldn't be undertaken, or maybe we should end uh, a war that isn't going well, or suggest any kind of retraction of America's military footprint. And so I wanted to know where this uh, mentality came from. And in my historical studies, it was very clear that um, for the United States to play a globe spanning military role would have been very hard to predict if you looked at the country uh, at its founding when George Washington told uh, his countrymen to avoid permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. In fact, it was very difficult for me to find uh, American, prominent Americans, leaders, intellectuals, for most of American history, who would say what is routine today, that of course the United States should be the number one military power holding itself responsible for enforcing world order uh, and ringing the globe with its military presence. 
that was just not a, a position uh, of much prominence in American political life until very late. And so that led me to my question. At some point, a decision had to be made for the United States to cast off its prior aversion to entering into military entanglements in Europe and Asia and instead adopt a global conception of its vital interests and decide to use its military force to back that up. So, so the narrative, your narrative, uh, centers on the period between the summer of 1941 uh, and the attack on Pearl Harbor uh, in, in December of 1941. And, and what you describe during that interval is a fundamental turn in basic US policy. Uh, talk to us about what that turn consisted of and why it happened when it happened. I didn't expect to find such a deliberate, uh, concentrated moment of decision as I did when I looked at the archives. Uh, but it turned out that the fall of France to Nazi Germany in the middle of 1940 really changed the equation for American foreign policymakers. Before then, uh, many uh, Americans had actually started to think about the shape of the world to come and what the United States would do in that scenario, uh, in, in, in whatever scenario the war produced. And they uh, uh, got going in uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, for example, and other places. But even through the first several months of the war, the so-called phony war in Europe, from the end of 1939 to uh, the beginning of 1940, they anticipated that it was you know, basically unimaginable that the United States would enter the war, let alone seek to dominate the, the, the world with military force after the war. So they pursued a kind of traditional conception of America's desire to you know, trade as widely as possible with the rest of the world, but confine its military commitments to the uh, Western hemisphere. The fall of France was an event that really changed that equation. Everyone was stunned, including some of Hitler's own generals, uh, that uh, the Nazis were able to uh, conquer France and conquer it in the span of just five, six weeks. And this raised the real specter that the Axis powers might attain dominance uh, in Europe and indeed across Eurasia. And perhaps it seemed if Hitler had discovered the, uh, uh, the uh, keys of offensive warfare, he might go on to uh, be successful in his invasion across the channel of Great Britain, and there might go the, the British fleet and the British empire. And so Americans had to confront a, a scenario they had never really thought about before. What did it mean for the United States for totalitarian powers to quite possibly be able to be the dominant powers in Europe and Asia. At this point, a lot of Americans concluded it was actually not so bad for the United States, that the United States was secure behind the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, as long as it denied any outside invader a territorial foothold in the Western Hemisphere, it'd be very hard to attack of the United States and mount a successful invasion. In addition, the American economy was quite prosperous and inward looking, especially after the Great Depression. So it really didn't depend on much foreign trade. And so a lot of Americans concluded uh, the United States should stay with its traditional uh, anti-entanglement tradition, defend the entire Western hemisphere, but don't go further. But to most foreign policy elites, especially those surrounding the uh, Roosevelt administration, they basically accepted that analysis. Direct US security didn't require anything more than the defense of the Western hemisphere. Same with American prosperity. And yet they figured that was not the kind of world that they wanted to live in. It might indeed restrict America's aspiration to have uh, American style liberal trade and intercourse throughout the world over the long term. 
In addition, it would compromise their expansive view of what we might call today American exceptionalism, the idea that the United States uh, should be the engine of world history uh, and lead the world to a more enlightened state. The difference for them now was that to get those things, to get universal liberal intercourse and to preserve American exceptionalism, it now required backing the kind of world the United States wanted to see by military force, by overwhelming military force by the United States. And so in short, there was a kind of choice forced between uh, armed entanglements and uh, liberal intercourse and American universalism. And people went in different directions, but over the course of that crucial 18 months uh, in 1940 and 41, it was very clear how many uh, prominent Americans were directly planning America's role for the post-war world, even as it remained an open question whether and in what ways the United States might get involved in the war itself. So but who's, whose were the voices that counted most in bringing this about? Now, I recall, uh, uh, remember Charles Lindbergh was the, uh, I think the, the face of uh, the America First movement, made some famous speeches in which he uh, tried to pin interventionist sentiment, he said, on Brit Britons, that, that Britain wanted us into war, and he also fingered American Jews, uh, deeply anti-Semitic. Yeah. Uh, but the story you tell uh, suggests that the voices that mattered in bringing about this turn were, were, were different, different groups. Talk a little bit about that. I think this was fundamentally an American decision, one that was, as I mentioned, opposed by other Americans. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I don't think there was, um, you know, that foreign influence, so we might yep. call it today, uh, fundamentally made, made the decision. Uh, instead, there was a, a set of uh, institutions that had developed in the wake of World War I. Think tanks like the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, universities got more organized to study international affairs and America's role in the world. And so at the same time, the what we call the military industrial complex today was not quite in place. The US military itself was fairly small. The State Department was short staffed. And so when bureaucrats wanted to think about the shape of the world to come, they didn't have much capacity in house. And so these enterprising, you might call them semi-officials, uh, in places like the Council and Foreign Relations saw an opportunity and set themselves up as unofficial post-war planners in this crucial uh, number of months prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor that finally brought the United States into the war. And so I think this was a civilian decision. I'm not blaming the military. I'm also not blaming fundamentally other powers for influencing uh, what the United States decided. So uh, one of the things you talk about in the book is how this turn uh, that was engineered, probably too strong a, ter uh, a term, but uh, uh, inspired by uh, these uh, policy uh, intellectuals, that this turn brought about a fundamental transformation in the meaning of certain words uh, such as isolationism and internationalism. Can you talk a little bit about that? So the people who uh, first imagined that the United States would play a globe-spanning role with its military understood very well that this was something destined to be highly controversial in American politics. In fact, they knew that they themselves had not previously advocated that kind of role for the United States. And many of them, when they had seen, you know, Great Britain play a kind of world ordering role, had complained that that was imperialistic. Now they were coming to the view that the United States had to play just that role. So they worried a great deal about the 
problem of American public opinion. And the way they characterized the American public, uh, as well as other opposing politicians and skeptics of the use of military force, was through this new term that they called isolationism. The ism of isolationism uh, dates only to the 1930s. It's only then that uh, the term came into widespread usage. For all of American history before then, which is still most of American history, nobody thought it made sense to describe the United States as isolationist uh, or even to use an epithet against their opponents to say, you're an isolationist, that's bad. Uh, it just didn't seem relevant at all. And part of the reason was many Americans, many leading figures, self-identified as internationalists. They opposed this idea of internationalism, not to isolationism, but rather to nationalism. And the question for people like Theodore Roosevelt was how to bring a sound nationalism and a sound internationalism into some kind of relationship. And so the question at that time was, what kind of role should the United States play in the world? Not whether it should play a role or retreat to its shores. This changed just as uh, uh, military dominance came to be uh, planned and became a live option for the United States. It's at that point that the people who favor armed dominance concerned about the way in which this new agenda conflicted with both the American nationalist tradition and the American internationalist tradition, which had always claim that the United States wanted to transcend power politics, they then uh, anointed themselves as the internationalists opposed to isolationists. So uh, next question touches on something that I think lies really beyond the scope of your book, but nonetheless, maybe you could talk about it. And that is, what role did this isolationism, internationalism dichotomy play uh, going forward? For example, did, did it play a role? And if so, what role did it play in laying the foundation for the Cold War? I think it played an important role. And this was one that was quite um, conscious in the minds of the people who promulgated this dichotomy. They were acting in good faith, by the way. They really believed that isolationism was a genuine position in American history and in American society, I don't think that they were trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. But even before we get to the, the Cold War period, uh, American uh, intellectuals and officials launch a campaign uh, nominally about getting the United States into the United Nations organization, but there was very little opposition all along to membership in the UN. I think the real issue uh, for for them was to stop isolationism now in, in one of their slogan and create a kind of bulwark of public legitimacy going forward so that Americans would not be tempted to return to their isolationist or non-entanglement tradition before as supposedly they had been tempted before, uh, sorry, after World War I. So there was a big campaign launched to, uh, to rewrite the narratives of Americans uh, of, of, of America's past in order to suggest that, you know, uh, not only that isolationism uh, had caused all these problems, but also that uh, internationalism was the only real option left. And that turned US armed dominance of the world into something that could simultaneously seem to to transcend power politics as the essential component of internationalism, even as it promised to dominate power politics. And that's a conception that carries forward, it carries forward with us still, but it also, I think, infused the Cold War. I think the story that I tell is the condition of possibility for the United States to render the Soviet Union as a grave threat to the United States of course, in the late 1940s, it was pretty unimaginable that the Soviet Union would actually literally invade the continental United States. But the threat uh, that uh, policymakers worried about was that it might 
subvert Europe or in, in, invade parts of Europe and lead to a situation where the United States uh, and its allies would not dominate Eurasia. And the choice to make the domination of Eurasia essential to American national security was not rooted in uh, the advent of the Cold War, the late 1940s. It was instead rooted in the 1940 and 1941 decision. So let's jump forward to the present. Um, why does this dichotomy persist? I mean, here, here we are 80 years later, uh, and it's striking, at least to me, uh, the extent to which discussion of basic US policy still revolves around the imperative of avoiding an isolationism that, as you suggest, never actually existed, and of clinging to a conception of internationalism that really isn't what it seems, isn't, isn't what it, 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 it pretends to be. What, why, why are we stuck in this past? We're stuck not because we haven't, uh, scholars haven't uncovered the fact that so-called isolationists actually have a vibrant range of views and even the America First Committee that which you mentioned, which would be the isolationists if anyone is, the key plank in their uh, whole platform was that the United States should defend the entire Western hemisphere by force. Is that isolationism as Central Americans, as South Americans, whether that's isolationism? So, you know, this myth has been debunked a lot, but the reason it persists uh, is because of the use that it performs. It allows uh, people who want to legitimate US global primacy uh, to do so because the alternative is unthinkable, isolationism. It turns uh, any restraint on the use of American force somehow into an act of selfishness. So it is a remarkable conceptual construct and it's of incredible importance uh, to the people who want to paper over uh, the contradiction uh, between the American aspiration to overcome power politics uh, and the American agenda, such as it is today, of dominating power politics. And, and minimally affected by the events of the past couple of decades, it seems. I mean, uh, of course, the, the election that we've just had, uh, minimal discussion of foreign policy, virtually no discussion of the failures and disappointments that resulted from this effort to uh, secure primacy. I'm referring to the Iraq war, to the Afghanistan war, uh, to, the, to the endless wars. Uh, I have a hard time understanding the persistence of this so-called internationalism, uh, given what we have all experienced over the last couple of decades. Help me understand that. I have a hard time too. You know, I, I do think that the dichotomy helps to suppress the debate such as we've had. So as soon as you're for ending a war somewhere, you know, not making a new commitment to defend another country, anything like that, you can be labeled an isolationist. And so you, if you are an ambitious person and you want a career in this world of foreign policy making, you at least want to, uh, you know, walk on eggshells when discussing any retraction of America's military role in the world. At the same time, I do think that um, things are changing. Uh, you know, four years ago, President Trump was mislabeled an isolationist by a bipartisan chorus, uh, including his political opponents. And you know, leaving aside the inaccuracy of that claim, which is evidenced by almost everything Trump has done in office, including building up the military as he promised to do, uh, you know, failing to end a single endless war, uh, and so on. Even leaving that aside, it turned out that the, the I word lost its power. It didn't seem to stop any voters from uh, voting for Donald Trump. In fact, it might have confirmed exactly what he what he uh, wanted to convey, which is that he would be a change uh, from the status quo. Uh, 
And, you know, I think in this election, we just witnessed the first election in American history where both major party candidates uh, recognize that the United States is engaging in endless war making and pledge to bring endless war to an end. Now it's gonna be easier said than done for sure, but clearly something is changing about the way Americans conceive their role in the world. And I think that has a lot to do with the implications of the original decision for primacy. You know, originally, the decision for armed dominance had a kind of coherent logic to it. The logic was something like this. Uh, you know, we've discovered after dangerous events that totalitarian powers are capable of amassing great power and potentially dominating important regions of the world, namely Europe and Asia. Uh, unfortunately, tragically, the United States needs to stop uh, them from doing that. It's better our power than their power. And so there's a logic to that. But the logic runs out in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapses completely. And yet America's commitment to global dominance has kept going. But I think a lot of Americans sense, even without a whole lot of cues coming from political elites, that something's gone wrong and that there's not a clear purpose for America's globe spanning military dominance. And so I think that impulse is now coming to the fore uh, in our own politics. And it makes me think that uh, despite the 80 year record uh, of American uh, global dominance, we may be uh, in for a change going forward. You're more optimistic than I am. Uh, and what I mean by that is I, 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 did, I, I very much agree that uh, to understand Trump's election in 2016, to understand why he got what, 74 million, 75 million votes uh, this year, one explanation, not the only one, is that the American people are fed up with uh, policies that aim toward militarized uh, primacy. That said, uh, it, it, the election of, of Mr. Biden is being greeted as a return to normalcy. And, and it's a normalcy that assumes that, as I read it, I mean, you may disagree, disagree and I'd like to hear you. Uh, it's, it, it's a normalcy that assumes American primacy. You know, assumes that this, this notion of American global leadership will be informed by uh, a, a dominant military position. Do you, but you, you're reading it somewhat differently? Not necessarily. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there's much in the record of Biden that suggests that he wants to, you know, bring an end to American military primacy. Um, but I also think there's indications in his own past that he understands where the American people are. He understands that, uh, that the United States has experienced considerable uh, overstretch. And in the Obama administration, he was uh, a voice opposing the surge in, a, of, in Afghanistan. For example, that's quite significant. Yes. It may be that uh, that was his preferred policy. It may also be that he was worried about uh, the president being boxed in by his other advisors. Either way, that suggests some savviness on the part of Biden. Uh, but look, I, I think that the long-term trends here are considerable. Uh, the United States uh, internationally faces a very different situation from the era in which uh, primacy was kind of reborn after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, at, in the 1990s, the United States could have its cake and eat it too. It could uh, cut defense spending as a percentage of GDP and yet uh, em emerge more powerful than ever before by the end of the decade. We are now having to deal with a much more constrained international environment. And that forces 
choices to be made. And that's actually a good thing when you look at the record of our foreign policy uh, under the most propitious circumstances one could possibly imagine and that we're not getting back. And then I think domestically, times are changing too. Uh, Democratic voters, it's not just people on the left, Democratic voters in general rank climate change as the number one national security threat above you know, Russia, above China. Now, and I think the people around uh, Joe Biden might share that view, in fact. They certainly are gonna take climate change very seriously. And if you take that to its logical conclusion, it really means that the United States should be rethinking its fundamental role in the world. If planetary and transnational uh, challenges like climate change or pandemic disease truly pose the greatest threat to the American people where they live and work, as I believe they do, it means we shouldn't be sacrificing opportunities to uh, collaborate on those areas with other powers for the sake of pursuing more military dominance. Makes sense to me. So when I made the introduction, I screwed up. I screwed up, Stephen, because I forgot to hold up your book for people to see. <laughs> this, is, this is a great book. It's a beautiful cover. It's a great book that uh, I hope everybody who's participating in this event will, will read, uh, pr preferably by buying a personal copy. But I think it's time for us to transition to uh, the Q&A uh, period. And I'm hoping that on my chat screen here, uh, there will be some, uh, some questions appear. They have not yet, but uh, let's see if that happens in about the next 10 seconds. If it doesn't, then I'll have to come up with another question and we'll continue our discussion. I think I'm seeing them on a separate tab called Q&A. Aha. To the right. Okay. Uh, let me begin. This is from Marjorie Harrison, uh, Stephen. Uh, how do you see the foreign policy factions within the Democratic House delegation playing out in the upcoming period? I would, I would assume that really referring to the, in particular to the, to the progressive wing of the party where, which seems to have a lot of energy these days. It certainly does. And I think that wing of the party will be basically as prominent in the next four years uh, as they've been in terms of the number of seats in, in Congress. Uh, and I think we've seen some tremendous uh, progress, a real ferment uh, in progressive foreign policy circles uh, that has directly questioned America's commitment to global dominance, particularly when it comes to dividing up the Middle East into friends and enemies and backing one side basically uncritically and demonizing the other side. And there's a great appetite uh, for reform uh, in that part of the party. And it's not limited to uh, progressives. There are a lot of centrists, especially fresh faces who have come into the Congress uh, and who know where their voters are. They've actually spoken to voters recently and they know what their priorities are. And I also think on top of that, it'll be very interesting to see how uh, the Republicans uh, find a foreign policy message uh, in the wake of President Trump's loss. Uh, he has opened up that space as well uh, and made it, I think, more challenging for the neoconservative voices that we might be used to, uh, to predominate in the party. And so something that we saw in the course of the Trump years um, was cooperation on a transpartisan basis by uh, progressives in the House and some conservatives as well. They formed something called the War Powers Caucus, for example. I would really like to see that continue over the next four years and beyond, and I think it will. And not only that, uh, I am hopeful that after this four years of President Trump, whether you agree with my views on uh, what American foreign policy should be or not, you really ought to be in favor of Congress exercising its authority over war and peace that the Constitution gives to it. Uh, there really should be, I think, an appetite 
uh, to repeal some of the uh, authorizations for the use of military force from 2001 and 2002, and in fact, overhaul the War Powers Act in general so that Congress is in the driver's seat when it comes to uh, declarations of war as it ought to be. So I'm looking to see whether we'll, fi we'll find some congressional leadership uh, on, on that issue. Well, let, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, the future of the Republican Party with regard to foreign policy. And let's, let's stipulate, just for the sake of discussion, that uh, Trump's hold on the party uh, eases. And, and therefore that the party can once again reclaim control of its own fortunes. I guess, who, who do you imagine, whether people in office or, or, or you know, intellectuals, who do you imagine can uh, provide the Republican party with a, a new azimuth that would be genuinely responsive uh, to conditions? I mean, I'm with you. I hope it's not the neoconservatives because they contributed mightily to getting us into the mess we're in. But, but what would a Republican foreign policy look like in a post-Trump world? My sense is that um, because uh, President Trump brought a lot of voters out on his side in the election, even though he was defeated, quite soundly it looks like, um, his prominence in the party is going to remain in place. Uh, maybe not to the degree that it's been in the last four years, but it's gonna be quite significant. But I think even that allows room for a healthy debate to take place about, well, what was, it, it seems as though Trump's foreign policy pitch was quite popular and might've even been the difference maker for him four years ago. When you look at uh, communities that suffered high casualties in war in the crucial states of Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And you see more and more Republicans in Congress take note of that. So, you know, a rejection of endless war, I think, is likely to remain a popular position. What will that mean for uh, Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq in particular? We'll have to see, but I, you know, I do not expect there to be a uniformly hawkish disposition as there was uh, in opposition to Barack Obama uh, and some of the uh, diplomatic overtures that Obama was able to achieve like the, um, the nuclear deal with Iran. I think China is more complicated uh, because Trump often led a very vigorous charge against China and I fear that um, becoming anti-China is kind of part of being, uh, is, is, is becoming part of almost being a Republican right now. And that's an issue on which neoconservative hawks and America firsters seem to align. So I think that's a really important uh, test as well. I mean, it's a question for the Democrats as well, where they're gonna end up on, on China. But I'm, I'm quite concerned about, um, you know, overly anti-China sentiment becoming a defining feature uh, on, the, on the Republican side. So here's a question from Bruce uh, Newling, uh, and, and this is more back into the historiography of the issue. Uh, he asks, how did the policy intellectuals of 1940-41 see the role of the British empire? And he goes on. Wasn't the retreat of British power in the late 1940s a big factor behind Washington's drive for global power? It was very important um, because as Britain hung on against the Nazi onslaught, even as that happened, American observers understood that it was no longer going to be the robust unchallenged entity in Europe and Asia and be able to both police the Mediterranean and police East Asia. Uh, and so now it wasn't obvious though, if you look at uh, who these people were prior to the fall of France, that that would elicit a call for the United States to take the role of Great Britain because the traditional internationalist position had been that the United States doesn't need to do that. 
uh, you know, let peaceful intercourse, commerce, uh, do everything that it can do. And if it's not in the vital interests of the United States uh, to make a security commitment, it's not necessary. So as France falls, that view is discredited. There's no transcending power politics anymore. Then the question becomes what configuration of power can best secure something like a liberal world order. And in 1941 in particular, uh, many of the post-war planners uh, explicitly planned for what they call American British dominance. Uh, they put American before British because they perceived that British power had been weakened such that the United States would now clearly be the senior partner in the relationship. And uh, in fact, at the height of enthusiasm for Anglophone partnership, uh, some of the post-war planners in the Council on Foreign Relations drew up an act of Congress that would have extended uh, citizenship essentially to uh, Anglo settlers across the, the British Commonwealth of Nations. Obviously that idea didn't get very far, but that is how deep, how deeply they were thinking of a kind of permanent uh, intimate partnership with the Anglophone world for a period of time. Now, of course, that view broadens as the Soviet Union enters the war and it broadens ultimately into the universal uh, United Nations. But I think it's quite interesting how for a revealing number of months, uh, the British empire, which had traditionally been looked at with great suspicion by many US elites and much of the public suddenly came to be revalued and seen as a basis for US policing after the war. So here's a question from Roland Pop, who is in Switzerland. Uh, and, and what he wants you to do is connect the turn that you described at the outset of World War II with the events of World War I. Here's the question. I'd like to know whether there was an understanding among the relevant people that the establishment of US financial primacy after World War I had failed because it had not been bolstered by political and military hegemony. That is, how much was the turn of 1940-41 an implementation of lessons learned from World War I? I will agree with the first part of the question wholeheartedly. The way that uh, the architects of American dominance saw things in 1940 and 41 is precisely that the United States had all these resources coming out of World War I. Uh, it had practiced uh, economic and financial diplomacy in Europe, but it had failed to back up uh, its economic power with political and military power, and that had been the crucial problem. Uh, so I think that's uh, very much how they understood it, and they would always ask themselves and see what they were doing uh, through the lens of what have we learned from the earlier experience of World War I. But I don't think that that means, uh, as the questioner might suggest, that we should interpret uh, their own view of things as of 1941 at face value. Um, so, you know, was it really an implementation of a goal from World War I? Well, they didn't think so for uh, two decades until finally they decided, oh yes, this is what we were planning before. So I think we should take the two decades seriously. Uh, indeed, the entire pattern of uh, U.S. conduct uh, prior to World War I as well, in which the United States had tried to, uh, you know, prosper economically and use uh, its economic and financial power, yes, but had tried to avoid military entanglements. The United States was, by uh, some measures, it had the largest economy of any country in the world by the 1870s. And yet for all this time, from the 1870s until the beginning of 1940, very few Americans had thought that America's economic supremacy was dependent on or needed to be backed by 
military supremacy as well. Stephen, I got to tell you, this uh, question thing is driving me nuts. I, there was a question here by Mary Dudziak. Oh, I Mary. To ask you, and it's disappeared. It's vanished into the ether. But here's one from Paul Eaton, uh, who, as you know, is a member of the Quincy Institute uh, 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 board. Paul writes, our war colleges, geez, Mary Dudziak just popped up again. Our, our war colleges guide senior leaders approach to foreign policy analysis by using national interest and adjectives like existential, vital, and conditional. But when our senior military leaders observe foreign policy development by civilian leaders, they see disconnects, sometimes wildly divergent disconnects. And Paul says, how do we reconcile? And I, I, I take that to mean, how do we reconcile these divergent perspectives of uh, senior military officers and senior civilian officials? It's an excellent question. I, I don't quite know how to reconcile them. Uh, you know, civilians ought to have a, a robust framework for analyzing American grand strategy and foreign policy. So if there's a lag there, uh, that is most unfortunate. Um, you know, I think something that I've seen in both realms, however, uh, is a tendency to equate American interests, whether they're vital or existential, with the interests that the United States has acquired by virtue of pursuing armed primacy and having over 800 military bases around the world and so forth. I see this mistake made again and again in analyses of American foreign policy. I think it's really important for strategists to pull back from the world as we see it today and ask, what are American interests if we could reconstruct America's world role from scratch? Now, we can't do that. That's important. But that's the more meaningful, more profound strategic framework that then I think puts us in a position to understand what kind of security commitments and engagement should the United States undertake. Uh, what we can't do is allow, uh, you know, interests that the United States has acquired by virtue of having dozens of allies and partnerships uh, and stationing its forces to and fro uh, to uh, turn into a self-fulfilling prophecy by, by which we've got to defend everything that we've already done and there, there can never be any pullback. That will just set us up, I think, for uh, a major failure and a moment of reckoning that we shouldn't want to have happen. So we need to be able to be deliberate and strategic in our I approach. Think, I, I think that's a profoundly important point. I mean, I, I, I'm in, in trying to follow foreign policy debates, I, I'm struck by the extent to which uh, the argument is made that, well, we have to keep doing that because all, we've always been doing that. You know, it's as if the most powerful country in the world has only obligations and no options. Uh, and if the world is changing, heck, the world is changing. Uh, it seems to be important to me that we exercise uh, some choice. Uh, but that's my little hobby horse. Here's Mary. When talking about the Constitution, the Declaration Clause is not the only issue. What's the strategy for dealing with the overly robust interpretation of the Commander-in-Chief Clause? by both Democratic and Republican legal elites? That's her question. That's a profound question and one that she is better positioned to answer <laughs> than I am. <laughs> Come but on, you gotta you got take a whack at it. I don't see any way forward absent a congressional willingness to step up on these issues. I don't think courts are going to reinterpret what they have long interpreted. Uh, so it, it fundamentally comes down to what does Congress want to do? And for that matter, perhaps we'll have an administration now, perhaps later, that actually does want to be more restrained in its use of military force and welcomes a return to a more proper relationship 
uh, between all the branches of government when it comes to national security policy. But we're still, I think, at the kind of early stages of Congress awakening from a very long, decades long slumber when it doesn't want to take political responsibility for making decisions over war and peace, and it will let the executive do what it's going to do. I don't think that the executive is fundamentally going to reform itself. It's not. I mean, would you describe this as uh, one of the deeply unfortunate legacies of the Cold War? I mean, it, it, was, it was dating from the Cold War, uh, early in the Cold War, probably dating from the, what was it, August 1949, when the Soviets uh, detonated their first nuclear weapon, that uh, the argument began to be made that the commander in chief needs to exercise the free hand. He is the only one who knows. He is the only one. He, he must be allowed to make those decisions. Uh, and that resulted, I think, in this vast expansion of presidential prerogatives on matters relating to war that have persisted to the present moment, even though the conditions that existed back in 1949 uh, are, are long gone. I'm with you. It's, you know, when, when will Congress uh, reassert itself? It's hard to be optimistic, but that's clearly, it seems to me, what needs to, what needs to happen. Here is a, uh, a question from Jim Lewis, who writes from Charleston, West Virginia. What role did the Holocaust have in furthering U.S. gathering support for World War II and for our growing national understanding that we are uh, called upon to be the indispensable nation? I am grateful for that question. Um, I think most Americans, including me prior to embarking on this piece of research, think back to World War II, think about why it was a good war, and think of the Holocaust. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the United States did not enter World War II to stop the Holocaust. It featured um, almost not at all in the planning documents that I scoured over. Um, so as a historical matter, when it comes to understanding, why did some Americans want to enter World War II prior to Pearl Harbor? And why did they make a decision not only to enter World War II, but to be the preeminent power after the war the Holocaust was simply not a significant factor for those people. It makes sense then that the Roosevelt administration uh, obstructed the arrival of Jews fleeing Europe at the time. So I think there's a real tendency because of the way Holocaust memory has become uh, so prominent in uh, recent decades for us to view this period through that lens, um, but it simply is not how Americans, uh, I think on either side of the issue, wasn't the main issue uh, motivating those who uh, favored uh, armed uh, intervention and armed global leadership or for those who didn't. But, but, but does it figure in retrospect, in other words? Uh... I'm, I, I'm with you. We didn't fight World War II to save the Jews. Uh, subsequent to World War II, I think there is a considerable sense of regret, maybe guilt, that we didn't enter World War II to save the Jews. And therefore, the, the arguments for perpetual military primacy are at least to some degree informed by the notion that only if we are militarily powerful will we be able then next time around to do what we arguably should have done last time. Does that, does that play in our, in our politics? I think it very much does play. And the Rwandan genocide of 1994 gave uh, new life to this kind of argument. Notice the historical pattern, though, 
routinely the United States does not act for humanitarian purposes. It did not act in World War II for the purpose of stopping or preventing the Holocaust. It did not act in 1994 to stop the Rwandan genocide. There are very few instances of the United States or other powers acting for primarily humanitarian purposes and achieving a humanitarian outcome through the use of force. So, you know, I would invite people to think about whether uh, this is a realistic role for the United States to play. We can keep saying that if only we summon the will to do good, maybe we can finally do good. But look at the record of things that we've actually done. You know, I think in our own time, the invasion of Iraq, which was not a humanitarian intervention, but was informed by um, many, I'm sure, sincere uh, 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 concerns about Saddam Hussein's tyranny uh, turned into an absolute disaster for the people of the country and the region. I think we should be um, not unconcerned. We should be concerned with um, you know, the worst tragedies in the world, and we should ask how the United States might constructively act. But we also need to be concerned with the sins the United States does commit. I just don't know a viable moral calculus that would um, have us obsess about uh, sins of omission while turning a consistent blind eye to sins of commission. We only got a couple of minutes left, so, but let, let, let me squeeze in one more question, but you probably need to be a bit uh, brief in answering. It's from Barbara Graveson. And I'll, I'll, I'll summarize the question. Why do you think foreign policy is not an issue in our political debates? For example, in the most recent campaign, why, why is that? I think we are emerging from a three decade period that's actually pretty unique in the sweep of American history in which there has been little politicization of foreign policy. And that has to be basically explained by the fact that the United States matters a lot more to the outside, to the rest of the world, than the rest of the world matters to the United States. Uh, and Americans have a kind of everyday understanding that what, even though now apparently the United States is committed to the defense of North Macedonia, uh, what happens in you know, North Macedonian politics uh, does not affect their everyday lives. In fact, the United States could go and uh, invade Iraq for no good reason. And I think it actually has brought a lot of negative consequences back to the United States, but it's nothing like uh, what happened to the region itself. So I think that's where we are. But I also think that things are changing. Uh, they really are changing. I mean, uh, President Trump had a kind of nationalist appeal, at least in his earlier incarnation, that inherently connected the foreign and the domestic. Uh, he said that the problems of America were due to this set of globalists around the world. That was a kind of innovative presentation of the case, whether you agree with it or not. And I think increasingly on the other side of the aisle, Democrats are seeing that their foremost priorities, they may be domestic, uh, like you know, instituting a Green New Deal to combat climate change, but actually they're international. I mean, the United States can bring its emissions to zero. That will help the problem of climate change, but it won't solve it. It's a planetary problem. And China, for example, is the country that emits by far the most carbon dioxide of any other country at this point. So we've got to find a way to work together. Well, Stephen, great discussion. Uh, thank you so much. Great book. Let me hold it up again. Encourage the people who have tuned in to buy a copy of this book. You can get it online. You can get it at your local bookstore. It is a fabulous piece of work. Uh, to those of you, if you, the people may want more, Stephen. Uh, if you want more quality time with Stephen, please consider signing up for a webinar on November 18th, along with uh, Trevor Thrall from Cato, uh, the Eurasia Group Foundation's Mark Hanna, and Dina Smeltz 
of the of the Chicago Council. They will be discussing America, the unexceptional, the foreign policy the American people want. And you can get more details on that at our website, quincyinst.org. If you've not yet subscribed to the Quincy Institute's newsletter, I encourage you to do so. Again, go to quincyinst.org. That's where you get information about all of our activities and all of our publications. So again, I thank all the participants for spending an hour with us. And I know they will join me in thanking Stephen for this illuminating discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.